Okay, everyone, so this is one of my favorite chapters of the My Lady book. Um, I know for some they don't like this, but this is chapter 12, The Basics of Chemistry. Chemistry is one of my favorite subjects to study along with biology. Um, when I was a pre-med major, I loved chemistry, learning about it, being in the lab. And I know that sounds intimidating to a lot of you because you do work with a lot of numbers, but here's the good news. We are not gonna be studying intense chemistry. We're gonna be puzzled. That is for when you're doing um, continuing education if you decide to specialize in hair color or texture because you will need to know um, more advanced chemistry if you want to get good at your services. But if you think about this, when you think about chemistry, um, I like how the book explains it. What do you envision when you hear chemistry? So like close your eyes and think for about a minute. Do you picture a lab with all kinds of beakers and vials? Do you picture maybe a microbiologist with fuzzy petri dishes? Do you picture someone who has um, got all these complex formulas written on a chalkboard? Those are examples of chemists, but if you also think about what we do in the salon or even skincare or nail care, we're all using chemicals. This product right here, this um, toner right here, all made of chemicals. This hairbrush, this is matter, that's a chemical. We are made of chemicals. Our bodies are living, breathing machines that function on chemical reactions. We take in nutrients, we excrete waste, we have chemical processes that break our food down so we can eat it. Everything that is around us is chemistry. So it's important to know that um, when you're talking about chemistry, you're doing it and you're, you know chemistry without even thinking about it. So it's something that is in your life, but you're not actively thinking. Um, you also wanna know, like in that little did you know box, that when you talk about chemistry, if you use words chemicals to describe something, it does not always mean it's dangerous. Likewise, the word organic does not always mean that something is safe. So some examples of an organic chemical would be um, like a cyanide, that's an organic chemical. That's also very toxic. Um, a lot of the organic products we use, uh, such as um, chemical texturizers, hair colors, shampoos, those are organic, but they're not something you want to eat. Um, the word chemical, if you think of water, we drink water. But there's also chemicals that are harmful, and that's why it's important to know what you're talking about in this field. Um, some of the things that I also think are pretty cool chemistry is that if you don't take uh, anything out of this chapter, please please understand the most important part of this chapter that we're gonna talk about later, and that's the pH scale, because pH is the basic foundations of all services that we do. On a funny note, I just wanna um, add this in here before I forget later on. Um, when I was taking chemistry in my undergrad, I had a teacher that was telling us that, um, what was it? She said that all perms are acidic and something about chemical peels being alkaline. At the end of class, I just went up to her, we're making small talk, I'm like, oh, I'm a cosmetologist, I'm like, just so you know, I said they do have acidic perms, but most perms are alkaline. And she was shocked when I actually showed her the photograph of the perm chart in the book. She was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know there was such a variation. And that's true because for the most part, um, you may think of these chemists as knowing everything. There are certain times where us as professionals, we know the science that they don't know. So while this is a science, they don't really teach it to you in the college level. Like they don't tell you about like these products and how they work, which I think is a shame. I always wish there would be like a major, like I know in Europe, it's um, a little bit more of a different profession. They held it to a higher standard um, than here. But if they ever made like a beauty science major, like how cool would that be? Like learning about, um, you know, the chemistry of the stuff we do. But anyhow, before I totally geek out and <laughs> get way off topic, know these vocabulary terms. They're gonna be very important. You're gonna get quizzed on them. It's, this is a shorter chapter, but it's also vocab heavy. You want to know that chemistry is going to be defined as the science that deals with the composition, structure, and properties of matter, and how matter changes under different conditions. So if I can unpack that a little bit. Think about um, matter, we'll talk about later. Um, that's the form of a substance. If you take ice and you put heat to it, you put a heat source on it or an energy source, it's going to turn into vapor. That's, uh, you know, that's what we would study, how that changes, why that changes. Organic chemistry is all that organic chemistry is, to simplify this, it's the study of anything that contains carbon. Organic chemistry does not mean that something is safe. So organic substances contain um, carbon and some contain hydrogen and they burn. Although the term organic is often used to mean safe or natural because of its association with living things, such as foods or ingredients, not all organic substances are natural, healthy, or safe. Poison ivy, gasoline, motor oil, plastic, synthetic fiber, pesticides, and fertilizers all are all considered organic substances because they contain carbon. Hair color products, chemical texturizers, shampoo, conditioners, styling aids, nail enhancements, and skin products are organic chemicals. 
you also want to know too that organic things can combust. So if you think about it like this, um, there are rare cases if someone, especially if they have a lot of mineral buildup in their hair and you're using heat with a high level of um, bleach and you know developer, that can actually cause combustion. It's very rare, but it happened. Um, look up the incident at the Kim Vo salon. He was a famous colorist. This incident did hurt his reputation. He had a client who was actually head caught in fire and it was pretty scary. On the flip side, inorganic chemicals is a study of substances that do not contain carbon but may contain the element hydrogen. Most inorganic substances do not burn because they do not contain carbon. Inorganic substances are not and never were alive. Metals, minerals, ugh, metals, minerals, glass, water, and air are inorganic substances. Pure water and oxygen are inorganic, yet they are essential to life. Hydrogen peroxide, hydroxide hair relaxers, and titanium dioxide um, Titanium dioxide used in nail enhancements are examples of inorganic substances. So think of organic. Organic has carbon, inorganic, no carbon. Organic was once alive. So if you think about that, what gasoline and oils were, they were once at some point um, from, they were made from living substances like uh, plant matter that was uh, fossilized and then we drill and we get it. Back in the day, um, hair color aniline deriv derivative tint was derived from some kind of source like that, petroleum. Now it's all synthesized in the lab, so it's not like it was back in the day. Um, so now that we've covered the branches of chemistry, we're going to talk about matter. So matter is going to be defined as any substance that occupies space and has weight. So matter is something that I can hold like this product. It's the air that I'm breathing. Um, yeah, everyone take a deep breath in and out. That is matter. That's air. Air is occupying the space around us. This is empty, but my water bottle that had water, that is a type of matter. Matter has physical properties that we can touch, taste, smell, or see. Everything you can touch and everything you can see, with two exceptions, light and electricity, is matter. The reason is because light and electricity are energy. They don't occupy space like matter does. For example, the electricity flowing through this camera right now, I can't see it, and I also can't hold it and touch it. It's something that is, um, it's a little complicated to explain, but it's something that is being created and it doesn't have like a, a fixed space like this solid object or this liquid. It's something that is generated. Um, you can see visible light and light that electrical sparks create, but they're, they are not made of matter. They are forms of energy and energy is not matter. Everything known to exist in the universe is either made of matter or energy. So we either have stuff that we can see, touch, taste, or smell that's matter, or energy sources such as light and electricity. Those are the two things that make up life on Earth, and there's no exception to this rule. Energy such as electricity does not occupy space or have weight, so you can't like, you know, if I take my scale out, I can't weigh electricity that's on my camera. Um, we'll discuss about energy more in the later part of this, I mean the next chapter, chapter 13. Um, what else on this? So. All matter is also made up of chemicals. You want to know that. Um, elements. Element is going to be the simplest form of chemical matter. It cannot be broken down into a simpler substance without loss of identity. So again, we're going to be using that same um, lens to learn about things in this chapter as we did in anatomy. Think of something small and build up. So an element is something that you can't break down into a smaller unit. It's very, very small. It's a substance such as um, if you know from chemistry, there's a periodic table of elements. Those are all of your elements. You know, oxygen, you can't take oxygen and break it down into some other element. It's the smallest form of element without losing identity. There are 90 naturally occurring elements, each with its own distinct physical and chemical properties. All matter in the universe is made up of these 90 different chemical elements. There's different combinations too. Each element is identified by a letter symbol, such as O for oxygen, C for carbon, H for hydrogen, and N for nitrogen and S for sulfur. Symbols for all elements can be found in the periodic table of elements in chemistry textbooks or by searching the internet. Um, atoms, so if we break elements down further, if we look at them, um, if you know from the models that you'll see, you'll see these little models with like a circle and then rings, you're gonna be looking at atoms. Atoms are the smallest chemical components, often called particles of an element. So if I take the element of, um, let's say sulfur, I'm gonna look and see those atoms in sulfur. The atoms that comprise sulfur are the smallest unit that we can measure. They have the same properties of an element. Elements are different from one another because the structure of their atoms is different. Atoms cannot be divided into simpler substances by ordinary chemical means. If we want to build up using atoms, um, 
Think about molecules. A molecule is going to be a chemical combination of two or more atoms in a fixed proportion. For example, water is made from hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. Carbon dioxide is made from carbon atoms and oxygen atoms. Atmospheric oxygen and other chemical substances such as nitrogen and water vapor make up the air you breathe. This type of oxygen is called an elemental molecule. An elemental molecule contains two or more atoms of the same element, in this case oxygen. So for example, O or O, not O, that's a bad example. Think of O2. O2 is going to be ozone. Um, and it can also be uh, dangerous because it's smog. Um, and then the other one is O3, which is another type of, um, what's this one, O2, O3. They need to edit this chapter a little bit because it does get a little confusing. So it contains three atoms of element, what is that, smog. So smog is O3, that's a type of ozone. So no, um, you don't have to like memorize that, but just know that um, the concept is that if you take the same um, element and you add on to it and add on to it, such as um, you know O or O2 or O3, that's a type of um, elemental molecule because it's the same element of O. If I add it in like you know H2O, that's not considered an elemental molecule because it has a hydrogen added. Compound molecules, also known as compounds, are chemical combinations of two or more atoms of different elements in fixed proportions. So examples, water, H2O2, um, sodium chloride, carbon dioxide, CO2, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Um, know that matter has three different physical forms. Matter can be a solid, such as this chair that I'm sitting in, this table that I have the camera on. The camera itself is a solid. Liquid, the water I was drinking was a liquid. And gas, the air that we're breathing in. So this is very basic, solid, liquid, or gas. These three forms are called the states of matter. This will also depend on temperature for the most part. Um, water is the best example. When water is um, you know, liquid form, you can drink it. If I take that water and I lower the temperature, I get to the freezing point, I can freeze it in ice, a solid. If I take the water and I add hot temperature to it, I increase it, I turn that water into vapor, a gas. Know that every type of um, chemical substance has its own different melting point, boiling point, and freezing point. That depends on a lot of things. Read the little description box um, that gives you the description. So for example, a solid has a rigid fixed shape and volume. I can't take this um, you know, chair I'm sitting in and um, you know, mold it. I can't um, drink it like water because it's fixed, it's solid. Liquid has a definitive volume but takes the shape of its container. So for example, this chair that has a fixed shape and volume, it's in that chair shape. I can't change that shape of that. The liquid, if I take this water that was in here and I pour it in this um, shape, it's going to have a different shape. So you can change the shape um, by changing a container. Gas has no fixed volume or shape. It fills everything at different shapes, different areas. There can be different um, rates of gas. Gas is more free. Think about solid as being super restrictive, water being in the middle, and then gas being the most free you can be as a state of matter. Um, vapors, when they, this is another important point to know. Vapors can return to being a liquid when they cool at room temperature, unlike a gas. Steam is an example of vapor. Vapors are not a unique state of matter. They are liquids that have undergone a physical change. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the physical and chemical properties of matter. And we, if we have to, I'll take a little bit of a break because I know it's a lot of information at once. Um, you want to know that every substance has unique properties that allow us to identify it. The two types of properties are physical and chemical. Your physical properties are characteristics that can be determined without a chemical reaction and that do not involve a chemical change in the substance. Physical properties include color, size, weight, hardness, and gas glossiness. Um, so physical properties, if you think about that, it's something that is... Um, something that we would perceive, so color is something we perceive, but it also includes something that is um, quantitative, something we can measure, something that's physical that you can interact with. Chemical properties are characteristics that can only be determined by a chemical reaction and a chemical change in the substance. So for example, um, you know, would be rust. 
wood to burn or hair to change color through the use of hair color hydrogen peroxide. That's the chemical reaction occurring. Physical properties is something that we can like study just by looking at something, weighing it, getting an idea. Chemical reaction are gonna be altering this um, and maybe doing some experiments on that. Physical and chemical changes. Matter can be changed in two different ways. Physical forces cause physical changes and chemical reactions cause a chemical change. So for example, a physical change is gonna be a change in the form or physical properties of a substance without a chemical reaction or the creation of new substance. So an example would be if I wanna um, use a physical change, I'll just heat something up and I'll change the, uh, the ice into water or the water into gas. A chemical change is the change in a chemical composition or making up of a substance. This change is caused by chemical reactions that create new chemical substance, usually by combining or subtracting chemical elements. So for example, um, I give this example of a physical change. If I'm baking a cake, I'm gonna combine all those ingredients in a little pan, whisk it up and stir it. If I wanted to, technically, I can go in there and separate each individual little um, you know, molecule and component. It'll be a pain in the butt, but it's doable. But if I take that cake and I bake it in the oven, there's gonna be a chemical reaction that occurs and I can't take that cake that's cooked and extract the egg molecules, the sugar molecules, all that stuff. So that is the um, two basic components of that. I'm gonna let you guys take your five minute break, but I also wanna give you guys some practical advice to make you think. Take any kind of product you have laying around and look at the ingredients list. This is where chemistry is very practical because it will tell you what you're dealing with. Most of the time, actually all the time, when you're reading an ingredient, it is mandated to have all the ingredients that's in it that are listed in descending order. So for example, it will tell you um, from the first ingredient what contains the most of it, and as you go down the line, it's less of it. The manufacturer does not have to tell you their formula, such as like one cup of water and you know a cup of starch to make a, I don't know, like a, a cleanser or something. But let me read this um, hair product right here. I'll look at my ingredients list right here, and it will say aloe, um, barbensius, leaf juice, alcohol, steric alcohol, hydroxyl propyl starch. As I'm reading those ingredients, it gets less and less of the component. That is how you properly re properly read a label. And you also wanna know that what some of the symbols mean, because this chemistry chapter relates to that. Every product um, will give you a, um, looks like a little jar and it has a number. This one is 12 months. What that means is that after opening, you wanna use the product within 12 months because it will either expire or lose effectiveness. That's where practical chemistry comes in. So take your five minute break and I'm gonna come back to talk more about specific chemical changes such as oxidation, oxidation reduction, and all that good stuff.